Hi, my name is Erica and I'm the seahorse aquarist here at the Shed Aquarium. And today we're going to talk a little bit about seahorse bonding. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at one of our exhibits that has a bunch of our juvenile seahorses in it. These seahorses were actually born here back in September. So they're about five to six months old right now. There are two different species in this one exhibit. You wouldn't find them together in the wild, but here we can put them together and they can both exist peacefully in the same area. The ones that you're looking at right now are called Barbari seahorses. And these guys are really unique because they have a zebra striping around their mouth. Um, as far as I'm aware, they're the only seahorse that has that particular feature. There are also Erectus seahorses in here that happen to be a little bit more orange and they actually hide pretty well. Um, so they tend to be a little bit more brightly colored than the Barbarize do. They will change their color based on their surroundings. So you can see them be super brightly colored orange or you can see them be brown, um, depending on where they are. Uh, the parents for all of these guys are in our reserve area. So we kind of keep our breeding pairs in our reserve area just to be able to let them focus on doing that as opposed to being out in the public area. Seahorses um, do form monogamous pairs for the most part. Um, out in the wild, seahorse densities are not great. So usually when two animals find each other, they will form a pair and then continue to live together. If something happens to one of their mates, they will find another one. Uh, it'll take a little bit of time, but they will find another one. But while they're forming those monogamous pairs, um, they, they say hello to each other every morning by doing a dance um, which involves them circling around each other and moving up in the water column. Now, while this is a great way to just kind of reunite each other every day, this is also a practice run for egg transfer. So the female will transfer her eggs into the male's pouch. So the male gets pregnant, which is the best fact about seahorses ever. So when that happens, she'll put her eggs in his pouch and he'll hold on to those eggs for roughly three weeks, sometimes up to four, depending on which species it is, before he gives birth. So as they're doing this dance, it's just practicing to make sure that all those eggs get into the pouch and don't get wished away when the wave comes by or anything like that. So that's kind of a multi-purpose dance that they're doing in the morning. Um, again, you guys are looking at some of the babies and these guys are old enough to be eating adult mycid shrimp, which is what we feed our sea dragons and most of our signathic collection here. Um, we have them eating frozen food right now as opposed to live food. Um, frozen food is just more readily available for us, so that's what these guys are eating. And they spend most of their days just holding on to things with those tails. Um, they, it's kind of like their security blankets to be able to hold on to something so they don't get whisked away. So whenever you guys see them holding onto something, that's what they're doing. Sometimes it's another seahorse's face. I've seen that before too. Um, but for the most part, it'll be onto a plant or a rock or something along those lines. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about seahorses. Okay, now we're taking a look at the weedy sea dragons that we have here at Shed. We have three of them. There are actually two females and one male in here. Um, as you take care of sea dragons more, you kind of learn the difference between the males and the females. Um, our male has a super bright yellow tail. He's the one that you're looking at right now. So that's kind of how we can tell him apart. And he actually has, he doesn't bond and form a pair with either one of the girls that are in here. He actually flirts with both of them. And the dance that the sea dragons do is a little bit different than the seahorses, but they still do the same thing where it's a practice run for egg transfer. The difference between sea dragons and seahorses is the dance is a little bit more elaborate. And also the sea dragons don't have a pouch to hold those eggs. The male will actually hold the eggs on his tail. So you can see them on the outside. So this one takes a lot of planning in order to get this one just right. So what happens when they start doing this dance is they will swim up next to each other and start mimicking each other in the water column. They'll swim up and down, side to side, just kind of mimicking each other's behaviors. Then they'll come to a point where they will curl their tails outward from each other and just hold that position underneath the water. 
and they'll stay that way for as long as they deem it necessary. And eventually they'll start to move up the water column and the male will actually scoot underneath the female and sort of push her up into the water column. And they'll continue to do this practice run until they think that it's the right time to do it. So when the female is ready to release her eggs, she will swim a little bit in front of him and he'll basically catch the eggs on his tail. His tail becomes really sticky so the eggs will stick right onto it and then they break apart and that's the end of their courtship dance. It has happened a couple of times here, which is an amazing feat and makes me so happy that it's happened here. Um, so that's something that's really exciting. If you guys come down here and ever see them doing it and wonder what that is, now you guys know. Um, also in this exhibit, you can see there are some little shrimp swimming around in there. That is their food. So these are called mysis shrimp and we actually culture the mysis shrimp in-house in our live foods area. Live foods is really important for us to be able to get animals to breed. And so that's why we've deemed that we will grow live mice here for the sea dragons to try and give them as much opportunity to have a natural environment as we can. So these kind of live in the exhibit with them and the sea dragons are allowed, uh, able to pick off the, the food as they're hungry. It's not burst feeding, it's just kind of more natural where you would they would be in the wild, they could eat whenever they want to. That's kind of what we're mimicking here. So you guys can see swarms of them just kind of swimming around and they get to eat whenever they want to. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you learned a lot. So thank you for joining us. Hi everybody, my name is Andrea and I'm one of the animal care specialists that works with the beluga whales here at Shed Aquarium. Joining us right now, we have three of our beluga whales. We have Mayak, who is our oldest beluga whale here at Shed Aquarium. Woo! And we have two of her offspring. We have Anik right here, who is our second youngest. He's about a year and a half old. And then also over here is another one of my ex offspring. This is Kimalu. She'll be eight years old. So these three are related here. Good job. Um, both Kimalu and Anik have different fathers. So they are half siblings. And that kind of leads me into what we're here to talk about today, which is beluga social structure. Belugas live in groups called pods and those Groups can consist of maybe just a couple of animals all the way up to a couple thousand animals. And the groupings of those pods can differ quite um, markedly, actually. Sometimes you'll have groups of just mothers and calves. Sometimes you'll have groups of just adult males. And it seems that they're very flexible, which is really exciting. We're learning quite a bit about them. Um, most of their life is spent underwater. So they're a little bit difficult to observe. So we're still learning a lot. Um, and what's so interesting is that they're much more flexible their social structures are than we had originally believed. Um, some animals may come together for longer periods of time, but then they may separate and not see each other for months. Good job, buddy. What we're seeing is that it's often behavior that will drive groups of animals together. So perhaps they're migrating together or hunting or rearing calves together. They have been known to help rear other females as calves. So there's a very cooperative nature between beluga whales. So like I said, these three animals in front of me are related. Mayak here is our oldest adult female at Shed. And this is her youngest calf, Anik, who was born last, or excuse me, two summers ago, summer of 2019 now. Good job. And then Kimalu, who is his half-sister over here, will be turning eight this year. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to learn a little bit about blue whales, their social structure, and to meet some of our animals here at Shed Aquarium. Have a great day. My name is Brendan and I am an aquarist at Shed Aquarium. And I wanna to talk to you a little bit about some of the really unique relationships and partnerships we have between some of our animals. Specifically, I'm gonna talk about clownfish and anemones. Clownfish obviously made very famous by um, the Finding Nemo movies. They are very recognizable with their beautiful orange and white stripes. However, that is just one species of clownfish, and there are many different species of clownfish. We have skunk clownfish in this habitat, a nice, beautiful pink color, but they come in all different shapes and sizes. But for the most part, they all exhibit the same relationships between each other, 
and between their hosts, their anemones. So all clownfish live inside of anemones. Usually you can find them in pairs or small groups. These groups are led by an alpha female. She is the biggest, she is the most aggressive, she is dominant, she is in charge. But what's interesting about clownfish is that if the alpha female were to pass away or leave the group for some reason, the next most dominant male in line will then transition into a female clownfish and become the alpha female and start laying eggs. So this might sound kind of rare, but it's actually somewhat common in the fish world. The fancy term for these clownfish are sequential hermaphrodites. But there's many other fish like uh, wrasse, for example, or antheus, who do the same thing. Um, clownfish are actually all born as males. And then as they age and grow and develop and mature, they will develop eventually into females. Other fish are the opposite. They might all be born as females and over time transition into males as they grow. Now, given this relationship between the alpha female and the male, they each have roles they play in their partnership. So the females will lay eggs on the rock work around the anemones. And then the males, for the most part, are tasked with keeping them clean and using his fins to push water across the eggs to keep them well oxygenated and nice and clean and fresh. And if he doesn't do quite a good enough job, there is a chance that that alpha female might just replace him. So he has to stay on the top of his game, always working, always cleaning, always protecting those eggs. So the clownfish have a pretty good setup. They are protected by their anemone because anemones, much like, um, anemones might look a little bit like plants, but they are actually animals. And they are very closely related to corals and jellyfish. And what makes them so related is that anemones, much like corals and jellyfish, have stinging cells. So on their tentacles, they have things that will hurt you. So if I, you and I were to touch it, you might get a little irritation, some itchiness, maybe a little bit of pain. And this is what they use to capture and kill their prey. But you'll see these clownfish just swimming among the tentacles, don't seem to mind at all. That is because the clownfish have evolved to have a very thick layer of mucus all over their body. Most fish are covered in some layer of mucus, but the clownfish is just so thick that it keeps those stinging cells from penetrating into their skin and hurting them. So the clownfish have got a nice setup living inside of these anemones. We call this symbiosis, a partnership between two different animals that benefits usually one and sometimes both. So we know what the clownfish are getting out of it, but what are the anemones getting out of it? Well, clownfish may look small and beautiful and adorable, but they are actually some of the most aggressive and territorial fish you will find in the ocean. Uh, it is very lucky for us that they're only about two or three inches long um, and pretty harmless because any time any of our scuba divers get in the water with clownfish and anemones, the clownfish will harass them, bite them, defend their anemone. There is no predator too big that clownfish are afraid of. So anemones get a nice protector to keep them safe from any possible predators. In this habitat, we also have another form of symbiosis on our anemones. We have some crabs that, that live on our anemones. They are called anemone crabs. And they, they serve a similar purpose to clownfish. They use the anemone for protection, and they will also protect the anemone from possible predators. And crabs tend to be pretty messy eaters. So any food that the crab is eating and, and misses any pieces of detritus, the anemone will gobble up. Also, inside of the anemone itself is symbiotic algae. 
This algae is what gives the anemones their vibrant colors, and it also provides some food to the anemones, making them somewhat photosynthetic. So within this one anemone, you can find many examples of fascinating and unique symbiotic partnerships which is why I think they're some of the coolest things to spend some time looking at when you're at the Shedd Aquarium because you do not know what you will find. Hi, my name is Natalia. I'm an aquarist here at the Amazon Rising exhibit. I get to work with animals ranging from insects to fish to reptiles to amphibians and birds. And today we're actually going to talk about one of my favorite birds, which is the jacana. Um, she actually lives in this exhibit over here. This is Esmeralda. She's our female wattled jacana. She's actually preening herself right now. Um, one of the cool adaptations that you can actually see perfectly right now are her feet. She has elongated legs and toes, which actually help distribute her weight, which help to allow her to walk on floating vegetation, and it kind of makes it look like she's walking on water. Um, where you'll find them is throughout South America in wetlands. So she will live in floating vegetation and grasslands. Um, other animals that are housed with her right now are this Brazilian teal. This is our male. And then we also have some white-faced whistling ducks in here and then a ruddy duck. Um, in honor of Valentine's Day, we're actually going to talk about relationships. And something cool that Jacana's actually exhibit is called polyandry. And what this means is that they have multiple male mates. And this is actually not common at all within birds or really in the animal kingdom. Um, so something that scientists believe that has, this has evolved due to uh, a lot of high predation on their eggs, primarily from crocodiles. Um, so it kind of made like a little role reversal for them. So the females and the males kind of swapped. And so something has caused the females to almost become twice as large as the males, which is super cool. Um, and then the females have become territorial. They actually do not do parental care, it is the males. And so this allows them to free up their time and have more clutches and produce more eggs. And then the males will actually take care of the chicks and the eggs. And the females have a territory which can be up to almost two football field lengths, which is huge. And they generally have about four to five mates that they guard and they try to keep other predators and other females out of their territory. And while the females are doing this, the males are actually taking care of the eggs and taking care of the chicks. So what the males do is they'll help make their nest, which is partially submerged in the plants and it's made out of plant material like leaves and sticks. And then instead of sitting on the eggs like typical ducks do or other birds, they actually kind of sit in the middle and then they will tuck the eggs underneath their wings and they do this just in case their eggs or their nests start to sink so that way they can quickly scoop up their eggs and then fly away with them and they make a new nest. Um, they'll also do this with the chicks when they've hatched to protect them from predators. The chicks can also exhibit something called snorkeling and this is when there's an aerial predator they can actually dunk themselves underwater and then they'll hold their beak up and it'll look like a little snorkel and then they'll just breathe out of their nostrils and this keeps them hidden. Um, which, like birds can do, they can fly, but they're also great swimmers and divers, um, which she'll usually you'll see her swimming around in the exhibit a little bit, but she likes to walk along the plants and along the sticks that we have in here. Right now she's kind of ready to take a nap. Um, another thing that's pretty cool about the chicks is they actually hatch precocially, which means they're ready to go once they're out of the egg, as opposed to an altricial chick which kind of takes weeks to be able to even hold itself up. So I think that also helps allow them to have multiple clutches at once. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Jacana and their relationships. <laughs>